Mr. McCoy back with part 15 of A Wrinkle in Time. Mr. Murray released Meg and knelt in front of the little boy. Charles, his voice was tender. Charles Wallace. What do you want? I'm your father, Charles. Look at me. Pale blue eyes seemed to focus on Mr. Murray's face. Hi, Pop, came an insolent voice. That isn't Charles, Meg cried. Oh, Father, Charles isn't like that. It has him. Yes, Mr. Murray sounded tired. I see. He held his arms out. Charles, come here. Father will make it all right, Meg thought. Everything will be all right now. Charles did not move toward the outstretched arms. He stood a few feet away from his father, and he did not look at him. Look at me, Mr. Murray commanded. No, Mr. Murray's voice became harsh. When you speak to me, you will say no father or no sir. Come off it, Pop, came the cold voice from Charles Wallace. Charles Wallace, who outside Camsots had been strange, had been different, but never rude. You're not the boss around here. Meg could see Calvin pounding again on the glass wall. Calvin, she called. He can't hear you, Charles said. He made a horrible face at Calvin, and then he thumbed his nose. Who's Calvin? Mr. Murray asked. He's... Meg started, but Charles Wallace cut her short. You'll have to defer your explanations. Let's go. Go where? To it. No, Mr. Murray said. You can't take Meg there. Oh, can't I? No, you cannot. You're my son, Charles, and I'm afraid you will have to do as I say. But he isn't Charles, Meg cried in anguish. Why didn't her father understand? Charles is nothing like that, father. You know he's nothing like that. He was only a baby when I left, Mr. Murray said heavily. Father, it's it talking through Charles. It isn't Charles. He's, he's bewitched. Fairy tales again, Charles said. You know it, father, Meg asked. Yes. Have you seen it? Yes, Meg. Again, his voice sounded exhausted. Yes, I have. He turned to Charles. You know she wouldn't be able to hold out. Exactly, Charles said. Father, you can't talk to him as though he were Charles. Ask Calvin. Calvin will tell you. Come along, Charles Wallace said. We must go. He held up his hand carelessly and walked out of the cell, and there was nothing for Meg and Mr. Murray to do but to follow. As they stepped into the corridor, Meg caught at her father's sleeve. Calvin, here's father. Calvin turned anxiously toward them. His freckles and his hair stood out brilliantly against his white face. Make your introductions later, Charles Wallace said. It does not like to be kept waiting. He walked down the corridor, his gait seeming to be more jerky with each stop. The others followed, walking rapidly to keep up. Does your father know about the Mrs. W's? Calvin asked Meg. There hasn't been time for anything. Everything's awful. Despair settled like a stone in the pit of Meg's stomach. She had been so certain that the moment she found her father, everything would be all right. Everything would be settled. All the problems would be taken out of her hands. She would no longer be responsible for anything. And instead of this happy and expected outcome, they seemed to be encountering all kinds of new troubles. He doesn't understand about Charles, she said to Calvin, looking unhappily at her father's back as he walked behind the little boy. Where are we going? Calvin asked. To it, Calvin. I don't want to go. I can't. She stopped, but Charles continued his jerky pace. We can't leave Charles, Calvin said. They wouldn't like it. Who wouldn't? Mrs. Watson and company. But they have betrayed us. They brought us here to this terrible place and abandoned us. Calvin looked at her in surprise. You sit down and give up if you like, he said. I'm sticking with Charles. He ran to keep up with Charles Wallace and Mr. Murray. I didn't mean... Meg started and pounded after them. Just as she caught up with them, Charles Wallace stopped and raised his hand. And there was the elevator again, its yellow light sinister. Meg felt her stomach jerk as the swift descent began. They were silent until the motion stopped. Silent as they followed Charles Wallace through long corridors and out into the street. The central, central intelligence building loomed up stark and angular behind them. Do something, Meg implored her father silently. Do something. Help. <laughs>
save us. So what do you think Meg's father is going to do, if anything? Share your prediction with your fellow listener. They turned a corner, and at the end of the street was a strange dome-like building. Its walls glowed with a flicker of violet flame. Its silvery roof pulsed with an ominous light. The light was neither warm nor cold, but it seemed to reach out and touch them. This, Meg was sure, must be where it was waiting for them. They moved down the street more slowly now, and as they came closer to the dome building, the violet flickering seemed to reach out, to envelope them, to suck them in. Inside, Meg could feel a rhythmical pulsing. It was a pulsing not only about her, but in her as well, as though the rhythm of her heart and lungs was no longer her own, but was being worked by some outside force. The closest she had come to the feeling before was when she had been practicing artificial respiration with Girl Scouts, and the leader, an immensely powerful woman, had been working on Meg, intoning, out goes the bad air, in comes the good, while her heavy hands pressed, released, pressed, released. Meg gasped, trying to breathe at her own normal rate, but the inexorable beat within and without continued. For a moment, she could neither move nor look around to see what was happening to the others. She simply had to stand there, trying to balance herself into the artificial rhythm of her heart and lungs. Her eyes seemed to swim in a sea of red. Then things began to clear, and she could breathe without gasping like a beached fish and she could look about the great circular dome building. It was completely empty except for the pulse, which seemed a tangible thing, and a round daze exactly in the center. On the daze lay what? Meg could not tell, and yet she knew that it was from this that the rhythm came. She stepped forward tentatively. She felt that she was beyond fear now. Charles Wallace was no longer Charles Wallace, her father had been found, but he had not made everything all right. Instead, everything was worse than ever, and her adored father was bearded and thin and white and not omnipotent after all. No matter what happened next, things could be no more terrible or frightening than they already were. Oh, couldn't they? As she continued to step slowly forward, at last she realized what the thing on the days was. It was a brain. A disembodied brain, an oversized brain, just enough larger than normal to be completely revolting and terrifying. A living brain, a brain that pulsed and quivered, that seized and commanded. No wonder the brain was called it. It was the most horrible, the most repellent thing she had ever seen, far more nauseating than anything she had ever imagined with her conscious mind, or that had ever tormented her in her most terrible nightmares. But as she had felt, she was beyond fear, so now she was beyond screaming. She looked at Charles Wallace, and he stood there, turned toward it, his jaw hanging slightly loose, and his vacant blue eyes slowly twirled. Oh yes, things could always be worse. These twirling eyes within Charles Wallace's soft, round face made Meg icy cold inside and out. She looked away from Charles Wallace and at her father, her father stood there with Mrs. Who's glasses still perched on his nose. Did he remember that he had them on? And he shouted to Calvin, Don't give in! I won't help Meg! Calvin yelled back. He was absolutely silent within the dome, and yet Meg realized that the only way to speak was to shout with all the power possible. For everywhere she looked, everywhere she turned was the rhythm. And as it continued to control the systole and diastole of her heart, the intake and the outlet of her breath, the red mazma began to creep before her eyes again, and she was afraid that she was going to lose consciousness. And if she did that, she would be completely in the power of it. Mrs. Watson had said, Meg, I give you your faults. What were her greatest faults? Anger, impatience, stubbornness. Yes, it was to her faults that she turned to save herself now. So what would you say is Meg's worst Share what you think with your fellow listener. With an immense effort, she tried to breathe again the rhythm of it, but its power was too strong. Each time she managed to take a breath out of rhythm, an iron hand seemed to squeeze her heart and lungs. Then she remembered that when they had been standing before the man with red eyes and the man with red eyes had been intoning the multiplication table at them, 
Charles Wallace had fought against his power by shouting out nursery rhymes and Calvin by the Gettysburg Address. Georgie, Porgy, Puddin' and Pie, she yelled, kissed the girls and made them cry. That was no good. It was too easy for nursery rhymes to fall into the rhythm of it. She didn't know the Gettysburg Address. How did the Declaration of Independence begin? She had memorized it only that winter, not because she was required to at school, but simply because she'd liked it. We hold these truths to be self-evident, she shouted, that all men are created equal, that they, in, they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. As she cried out the words, she felt the mind moving in on her own felt it seizing, squeezing her brain. Then she realized that Charles Wallace was speaking or being spoken through by it. But that's exactly what we have on Kemsatz, complete equality, everybody exactly alike. For a moment, her brain reeled with confusion. Then came a moment of blazing truth. No, she cried triumphantly. Like and equal are not the same thing at all. Good girl, Meg, her father shouted at her. Charles Wallace continued as though there had been no interruption. In Kamsatz, all are equal. In Kamsatz, everybody is the same as everybody else. But he gave her no argument, provided no answer, and she held on to her moment of revelation. Like and equal are two entirely different things. For the moment, she had escaped from the power of it. But how? She knew that her own puny little brain was no match for this great bodiless, pulsing, writhing mass on the round days. She shuddered as she looked at it. In the lab at school, there was a human brain preserved in formaldehyde, and the seniors preparing for college had to take it out and look at it, study it. Meg had felt that when that day came, she would never be able to endure it. But now she thought that if only she had a dissecting knife, she would slash at it, cutting ruthlessly through cerebrum, cerebellum. Words spoke within her, directly this time, not through Charles. Don't you realize that if you destroy me, you also destroy your little brother? If that great brain were cut, were crushed, would every mind under its control on campsites die too? Charles Wallace and the man with red eyes and the man who ran the number one spelling machine on the second grade level and all the children playing ball and skipping rope and all the mothers and all the men and women going in and out of the buildings? Was their life completely dependent on it? Were they beyond all possibility of salvation? She felt the brain reaching at her again as she uh, let her stubborn control slip. Red fog glazed her eyes. Faintly, she heard her father's voice, though she knew he was shouting at the top of his lungs. The periodic table of elements, Meg, say it. The picture flashed into her mind of winter evenings spent sitting before the open fire and studying with her father. Hydrogen, helium, she started immediately. Keep them in their proper atomic order. What next? She knew it, yes, lithium, beryllium, Boron, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, fluorine. She shouted the words at her father, turned away from it. Neon, sodium, magnesium, aluminum, silicon, phosphorus. Too rhythmical, her father shouted. What's the square root of five? For a moment, she was able to concentrate. Rack your brains yourself, Meg. Don't let it rack them. The square root of five is two and 236 thousandths, she cried triumphantly times two and 236 thousandths equals five. What's the square root of seven? The square root of seven is, she broke off, she wasn't holding out. It was getting at her and she couldn't concentrate, not even on math and soon she too would be absorbed in it. She would be an it. Tesser, sir, she heard Calvin's voice through the red darkness, Tesser. She felt her father grab her by the wrist there was a terrible jerk that seemed to break every bone in her body, then the dark nothing of tessering. If tessering with Mrs. Watson, Mrs. Sue, and Mrs. Witch had been a strange and fearful experience, it was nothing like tessering with her father. After all, Mrs. Witch was experienced at it, and Mr. Murray, how did he know anything about it at all? Meg felt that she was being torn apart by a whirlwind. She was lost in an agony of pain that finally dissolved into the darkness of complete unconsciousness. So what do you predict is going to happen now? Share with your fellow listener.
first sign of returning consciousness was cold, then sound. She was aware of voices that seemed to be traveling through her across an arctic waste. Slowly, the icy sounds cleared and she realized that the voices belonged to her father and Calvin. She did not hear Charles well. She tried to open her eyes, but the lids would not move. She tried to sit up, but she could not stir. She struggled to turn over to move her hands, her feet, but nothing happened. She knew that she had a body, but it was as lifeless as marble. She heard Calvin's frozen voice. Her heart is beating so slowly, her father's voice, but it's beating, she's alive, barely. We couldn't find a heartbeat at all at first. We thought she was dead, yes. And then we could feel her heart very faintly, the beats very far apart, and then it got stronger. So all we have to do is wait. Her father's words sounded brittle in her ears as though they were being chipped out of ice. Calvin says, yes, you're right, sir. She wanted to call out to them. I'm alive, I'm very much alive, only I've been turned to stone. But she could not call out any more than she could move. Calvin's voice again. Anyhow, you got her away from it. You got us both away, and we couldn't have gone on without it. It's so much more powerful and strong than... Uh, how did we stay out, sir? How did we manage as long as we did? Her father speaks because it's completely unused to being refused. That's the only reason I could keep from being absorbed too. No mind has tried to hold out against it for so many thousands of centuries that certain centers have become soft and atrophied through lack of use. If you hadn't come to me when you did, I'm sure, I'm not sure how much longer I would have lasted. I was on the point of giving in, Calvin says. Oh no, her father says, yes. Nothing seemed important anymore but rest, and of course it offered me complete rest. I had almost come to the conclusion that I was wrong to fight, that it was right after all, and everything I believed in most passionately was nothing but a madman's dream. But then you and Meg came into me, broke through my prison, and hope and faith returned. So it seems like your brain does tend to atrophy when you don't use certain parts of it, what part of your brain would you say has atrophy? Share your opinion with your fellow listener. And now, milliseconds more of A Wrinkle in Time. Calvin says, Sir, why were you on campsites at all? Was there a particular reason for going there? And we'll find out what Mr. Murray says in response to Calvin's question and so much more as A Wrinkle in Time continues. <laughs>